We're going to finish this lesson by looking at two technologies that involve the electrical conducting properties of materials. These technologies aren't in the HSC physics syllabus anymore, so I'll just quickly skim through them. If you're interested in either of these things though, they would both make excellent topics for depth studies. To talk about semiconductors, we need to know a few terms from what they call condensed matter physics, which is just a fancy term for the study of solids. You'd all be familiar with the picture of the atom that has electrons in shells around the nucleus. And you probably know that each shell has one particular energy. Jumping from shell to shell involves the electron gaining or losing energy. In a solid though, the atoms get close together and no two electrons that are very close together can have the same energy. That's a thing called the Pauli exclusion principle. That means that the electron energy levels have to smear out so that they become a range of energy levels that is called a band. So in a single atom, the valence shell is the outermost shell. In a solid, the valence band is the outermost energy band of electrons that are still bound to their atoms. They're the ones that would take the least energy to actually break free. The conduction band simply indicates the electrons that are free of any individual atoms and able to form an electric current. The size of the gap between the bands in different materials explains the electrical conductivity of conductors, insulators and semiconductors. In conductors, which are metals, the valence band is basically almost the same energy or very close to it as the conduction band. That means at room temperature there are plenty of electrons that are free to move randomly around the metal. In insulators, the gap between valence band and conduction band is so large that virtually no electrons can get enough energy to break free and form a current. But in semiconductors, at room temperature a few electrons will have enough energy, one electron volt or so, that they need to get into the conduction band and move between atoms. Since the kinetic energy of electrons increases with increasing temperature, semiconductors actually have resistivity that decreases as they get warmer, which is the opposite of the case for metals. Semiconductors on their own would be of little interest, but in the early 20th century, scientists were looking at alternatives to the vacuum tube valves that early computers were made of. These valves had two functions. They could act as a switch and as an amplifier. With just those two things, you could make a computer. In semiconductors, researchers found ways of controlling how much current they allowed through so that they acted as a switch for current. Their solution was to add small amounts of other elements to pure silicon, which added extra charge carriers and so changed its resistivity. This process was called doping. Small amounts of group 3 elements like boron made p-type semiconductors, and group 5 elements like phosphorus made n-type semiconductors. Just putting a block of each of those types of semiconductors made a device called a diode, which acts as a one-way gate for current. Other devices include the transistor, which is an adjustable switch and amplifier, which makes it now the basic unit of all semiconductor computers. You can also make useful devices like light-emitting diodes, or LEDs, and solar cells. Now, very briefly, to superconductors, which really do have a resistivity that is zero. Currents have been created in superconducting rings that have circulated for years without measurable loss. In 1911, a Dutch researcher looking at how the resistance of metals changed at very low temperatures found that in some metals, below a particular temperature, which became known as the critical temperature, the resistance would drop to zero. 
See the graph at the top right, which shows mercury at about 4 Kelvin, or minus 269 degrees centigrade. All of these early superconductors were type 1 and had very low critical temperatures. It was also found that they stopped superconducting if the current in them was too large or if you applied a large enough magnetic field to them. It wasn't till the type 2 were discovered in the 80s that serious use could be made of superconductors. These operated at liquid nitrogen temperature and could tolerate much stronger magnetic fields without losing their superconductivity. They are now used in things like NMR machines, in some maglev trains, and in the strong magnets that they use in particle accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider. But the holy grail for superconductors is to make one that operates at room temperature. Then, just for one thing, electrical power transmission, which we're going to be looking at later, would be a very different field.